another webinar in our ongoing educational series of webinars uh, driven towards or really focused on builder's risk, course of construction coverage. Today is going to be a little different because we're going to blend in some loss control. I'll give you some claim examples, um, but it's all related to tropical storms, hurricanes, catastrophic events, uh, and the effect of you know being prepared, I guess. That's what we'll say. Every year we go through this, and it's an important time if you live in these affected areas, just to take a few moments and make sure that everything's in place. Some of this, too, will apply to your own personal uh, you know, homes if you live in these areas, but it's also uh, for your contractors that have projects ongoing. So kind of get into this. Uh, the format of these webinars are about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we seem to have kind of found the sweet spot for the time on these things. I do greatly appreciate you taking the time to, to think about it for a while. This is truly educational for everybody. Hopefully it gives you a time to think about it. All of these webinars are pre-recorded and put on our website. So I think you'll find today has some useful tools and ideas. And we're gonna to try to kind of stick to what do we do before the storm? What do we do when the storm's close by? What do we do during the storm? And then obviously, what do we do after the storm? So keep that in mind as we go through it. Hurricane season 2019 starts June 1st. So we're almost into May, so definitely time to start thinking about it. Uh, for those of us in North Florida, the water temperature is in the 70s. Uh, so once that water temperature gets up into the 80s, we know what's going to happen. So it's coming. So the uh, introduction here, establishing a plan. No, oh, sorry about this. Got it. So all of this is about really not waiting to the last minute. It's all about can we get prepared beforehand? That's really what this is all about. You need to be prepared. So in the construction industry, one of the most important things is the time. You know, they have certain schedules they have to stick to. If they don't, it costs them money. So time is money. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but keep in mind delaying completion, time element coverages. Uh, think about these catastrophic events and how it impacts the construction schedule. Uh, this is critical to understanding the, the risk involved for contractors that build in these areas. Let's ensure that the proper insurance is in place. You know, don't wait till the last minute and say, what wind deductible did I sell? Or I'm wondering if that project is insured to value. I mean, these are the kind of questions you need to ask now on April 25th. Uh, don't wait till June 1st. How's that? You need to understand limits and deductibles. Uh, for those of us that live in these areas, we're getting pretty, uh, the, 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 the normal consumer is starting to understand what a percentage wind deductible means. For example, uh, I have one of my homeowners and I had uh, some roof damage from a hurricane two years ago and I have a 2% wind deductible. So when the storm damaged my roof, uh, I hadn't done the exact calculation, but I had a $12,000 deductible on my roof. So it kind of gets your attention. So let's add a couple more zeros to that and the roof blows off a construction project and maybe they have a hundred and twenty thousand dollar wind deductible. So you get the you get the idea of how important deductibles are. You need to be aware of certain things. Uh, parts of the country there is uh, a wind pool, so a lot of times the wind is placed somewhere else. So you have a policy forever all AOP except wind, and another one on the wind it could be different coverages. Uh, you do need to understand the closer. Any construction site is to the water, the more exposed it is. That's just a fact. So you need to understand that. And for those of you in inland areas too, if they live on a river, we got exposure to that. If you live out west, we got the earthquakes. Uh, you guys got brush fires now on the west. So these things apply everywhere. A lot of what we talk about is not just hurricanes. Another thing we're going to talk about are things that they can do beforehand. This is like, how can we prepare the job site to, to mitigate the risk or mitigate the loss? And I think this is critical. Most of these things are pretty common sense, but uh, until you write it down and even have a checklist that you give your contractor, I think that's what I would do. Uh, that's what I would recommend. Let's talk about what's covered on a builder's risk course of construction in the marine policy. So, Obvious building materials and supplies used for construction. 
they're all covered as long as you you know the limits there you reported it correctly it's fine most forms now when i talk about this this is assuming that you have either an iso based form or an aais based form uh, most of these are proprietary forms so i do tell you you need to, to read the form whatever carrier you're selling and make sure that these things are covered. Curbing, paving, fences, outdoor fixtures. Do you think those things are exposed when you have a hurricane bearing down on you? Yeah, I'd say it's safe to assume it is. Trees, shrubs, plants, and lawns. What if the hurricane picks up a $10,000 palm tree and sticks it into the fifth floor of the building being built? So now you got damage to the building and then you got obviously the $10,000 tree is no longer in the ground so we got a big claim on our hands so you need to understand that foundations things can happen to the foundation what if you have a flood and the foundation's underwater maybe when the water recedes everything's fine maybe it's not fine maybe you have some pilings you have structures built on pilings sounds good protects from the flood now the flood recedes uh, maybe the, the pilings aren't quite as secure as they used to be could be a big big uh, could be a big problem there uh, we we insure some builders in the South Carolina, North Carolina, beast, uh, coastal areas, uh, and thank goodness we had the model homes insured correctly because there was some damage uh, last year when the storm hit that part of the country. So just a unique little thing to builders that you need to understand. Let's talk about what's not covered, and this is, doesn't mean that you can't get it covered. You just have to understand it's not covered on the standard builder's risk policy. Number one, existing buildings or structures. Builder's risk is course construction coverage, and the first exclusion that you see on the form is existing structures. So if someone has a building, they're going to remodel it. You've got to you've got to get a different you got to get endorse the policy or get a different type of policy to cover the existing structure. I definitely wouldn't want to be the agent on an account that has an existing structure that's being renovated, and you go, did I place the coverage on that existing structure or not? Let's get that in place now to make sure it's done right. The land. It's not covered on any insurance policy I've seen yet. I've seen a few that actually now build in a little bit of like landfill type coverage, but for the most part, uh, insurance uh, doesn't insure the land. Now you could argue that the flood comes and it washes away and all of a sudden it did actually take the land away. That's an interesting problem, not covered on builder's risk. Contractors, tools and equipment. Some of those uh, exotic generators they have or whatever they have out there, uh, concrete mixers and such, is not covered on the builder's risk policy. You need to get a tool and equipment policy, separate policy to make sure they're covered correctly. Plans, blueprints, drawings, renderings, all of those things are not covered. Sometimes they can be endorsed to the policy or you can write a separate policy, but not covered on the standard policy. And I think all of that electronic type stuff, you need to make sure that's protected if the building, you know, so we'll get into that in a minute. And that gives you an idea of what's not covered, uh, at least on the standard builder's risk policy. Coverage limits, do you think that's important? You know, the, the hurricane's bearing down on the building and you go, man, I was I bet meaning to get to the contractor or the developer to make sure we have it properly insured. Let's do that now. Uh, we had one the other day and uh, we had written the policy for $6 million. And the agent came a couple months a couple months later and said, "I miscalculated. They really need eight million dollars in coverage." Okay, it's not a problem in the normal time of year, but let's think about a hurricane bearing down and that happens. You might call the carrier, and now there's a moratorium. Uh, the carrier says, "I can't increase coverage. I can't add coverage because the storm's too close. It's within so many miles or whatever." Now we have a problem. You could have an insurance to value problem, a co-insurance problem. So now is the time to make sure that these projects are insured to the right uh, amount. What is the amount we're looking for? Try to keep it simple. I usually use the, the little thing saying selling price minus land. Because really all the stuff that goes into the structure is covered, the labor, the materials, the overhead, even the profit uh, that the builder is going to make when they sell it's covered on the form. So let's get it all in there. So selling price minus land is a good way to look at it. Uh, if you do have uh, time element exposures, take a look at that. Maybe uh, there's certain penalties and stuff that you could get covered uh, if they don't finish on time. So that might be something to look in. It's called delay and completion coverage. Uh, that would be something I would definitely look at. 
Another thing to look at is the supplemental, or I call the automatic coverage is built into the form. These things have supplements built in, transit coverage, temporary storage, scaffolding, sewer drain, soft cost. A lot of the stuff is built in, but it's built in at very low limits. So you want to take a look at those limits, might be time to bump those up. So you have, you know, 100,000 in soft costs, but you look at it and you say, I really think there's a half million exposure. Might be the time to sit down with the insured and say, let's bump these limits up a little bit. And obviously the optional coverages, which are not part of any builder's risk form, but you have to add separately, would be the big ones, wind, flood, earth movement, and those. Uh, obviously wind and flood are what we're talking about today. We wanna make sure that's all in place. A lot of times when these storms come, you know, we say, what's the proximate cause? Was it the flood that did the damage? Was it the wind that did the damage? Was it the water driven by the wind that did the damage? Was it uh, water surge did the damage, backup of water? If you have all of those coverage in place, we don't have to worry too much about what exactly caused the damage. All of that should be in place, and we shouldn't have to go into this problem about you know, no coverage because you didn't add the right coverage. So these are important. <clears throat> this is the thing I find that agents understand. You think you understand it and you might not. So there's different types of deductibles on in the Marine course of construction. First one is the all other perils deductible, the AOP deductible. Usually that's everything other than the wind and flood. So it's uh, the theft, the vandalism, the fire, uh, those type of perils, you have a deductible, $1,000, $2,500, $5,000. Usually it's a flat dollar amount. Uh, you know, so you understand the AOP deductible, but that doesn't apply most of the time to the wind coverage or the flood coverage. Under the wind coverage, what we see primarily today is percentage wind deductibles. So in a percentage wind deductible, they're not all the same. You need to read the one that's attached to your form. How do they calculate the percentage? Is it the completed value? Is the value at risk? Is there, if I've seen them sometimes where there's a schedule of properties and the deductible applies per structure as opposed to the whole schedule. I've seen it done both ways. I would recommend you read the form. If you can't figure it out, get on the phone and call your underwriter so you understand what is the percentage wind deductible. Name storm deductibles are very, uh, uh, are widely used today. Not everybody, not every carrier defines a named storm the same. Uh, I do find it funny today. Every storm is named. You know, CNN names it the thunderstorm Tom or whatever it may be. Or the, uh, what was this latest one with the the bomb cyclone that the storm, the winter storm that hit the Mid Atlantic? They had a name for that. Most of the ones I've seen are tied to the National Weather Service. And once they name a storm, a tropical storm, these deductibles apply. I said most of the time because I've seen different definitions of named storm. I would highly recommend you read your form, make sure you understand it. Uh, there are straight wind deductibles that don't require a named storm and they apply regardless of the storms named or not. So once again, you just have to understand uh, the coverage that you're selling. Now is the time to review the policy. All these things I'm talking about, you know, they apply all the time of year, but you want to do it now and you want to get it in place correctly because you do not want to wait till the storm is sitting off the coast and bearing down. Last year, when the storm hit North Carolina, South Carolina, my phone was ringing off the hook from agents saying, oh, I meant to call you yesterday, Jeff. I got this home, it was just started. We need to get it covered. And I'm like, I can't help you today. You can call me after the storm comes by, but I can't help you right now. And I know people got mad at me. They get mad at the underwriters, but it's not the underwriter making that decision. You know, that's the reinsurers and the insurance company as a whole. And these things have to be in place. Normally what I see is a distance. Uh, I've seen like 600 nautical miles. When, when a storm is 600 nautical miles or closer to a location, Binding ceases. You cannot bind any coverage. So I mean, you can't you can't write a new project. You can't increase values of an existing project. It's too late. And I I felt for those agents last year. I'm sure some of them had some had a lot of explaining to do to their insureds if they had damage. So it's just one of those things. I'd rather talk to you about it now. Uh, 
expiration date, something as simple as that on a construction project or when coverage ceases, you know, make sure that the coverage is not going to cease the day before the storm. Get that extension in place uh, well ahead of time. Uh, it's a lot easier. It's, well, it might be impossible to do when the storm's close. Uh, I've seen moratoriums, you know, sometimes they're even getting more cautious. You know, maybe a week out, they'll say, we're not going to, you can't bind coverage in Florida, Georgia, North and South Carolina, or you can't bind coverage in the Gulf Coast. These are big areas where they put moratoriums on. So think ahead. That's the key. There's a section of the builder's risk policy, when coverage ceases, and they're all a little different, but uh, they all have some of the same examples here. And I figured I'd give you a few. Uh, a lot of times it's occupied. When the building becomes occupied, you see uh, either uh, a percentage occupied, once it's more than 75% occupied, coverage ceases, or you'll see once it's been occupied for 90 days or more, coverage ceases. Uh, I've seen once it's put to its intended use, coverage ceases. Uh, a lot of times it's triggered by the closing. The reason I'm saying all of this is let's make sure that you have coverage in place, that the coverage didn't end a day before the storm hit. That would not be good for you or for me. Um, can I reduce the uh, there's another, if you write remodeling policy, so you have an existing structure and you've endorsed the policy that covers the existing structure, but let's make sure that there was no other clauses that would kick in, like maybe it hadn't been worked on for a while, so then the coverage is reduced. So it's just once again, talking to your contractor, making sure what's going on in the job site, things of that nature. Claims have been denied for these kind of reasons. Coverage ceases, no coverage. Let's talk about an action plan. And this is going to be on our website. You don't, I know you're trying to take notes real quick on this one, but you can access it on our website and write this down. But this is kind of what I said the whole thing is. You have pre-planning that takes, should be taking place now in April and May, getting ready for the season. So what do we do? We're going to talk about that. Now we have the tropical storm. This may be not a hurricane yet, but it's a tropical storm, and it's sitting out there, so we're going to – what do we do when, when that happens? You know, maybe it's uh, the watches become before the warnings. So maybe when the watch, you still have a little bit of time to get things in place sometimes. Sometimes you don't. Now we've entered into the warning phase, which means there's actually a hurricane that's coming your way. What do I do? And then the next thing is, what do we do after the hurricane? So we're going to talk about each one of these briefly uh, from a more of a loss control standpoint. But it seems like common sense. But... You'd be amazed. I see people scrambling around when the hurricane's, you know, eight hours away. And they're like, contractors like, yeah, maybe I should have tied that generator down or maybe I should have done something with that crane. And so now they got a few hours and they're scrambling around doing it. It's not the time to do it. So this should probably be something you would write down as a checklist maybe and give to your insureds. That would be a nice, uh, a nice gesture. I really like this satellite. That means this is from the Pacific from a few years ago. It's actually not made up. So I guess we're looking at two hurricanes and a, I don't know, some kind of front down there. But that's kind of how we feel this time of year when the, we know the storms are coming. So once again, it's all about creating a plan. So you have a plan. What am I going to do? How am I going to secure the job site? How am I going to secure all my valuable records? All right, now what am I going to do after the storm? You know, how am I going to find subcontractors to help my job site get back on track? Maybe I make that deal with them beforehand. So, because what, ha what happens when there's a storm? You got the subcontractors going all over the place, you know, that, you know, they, they can charge top dollar. And so they might be somewhere else hard to get. So let's make the deal with them before the storm. So they help us out. Once again, for, you know, employees, suppliers, we know that. But try to make as many deals as you can beforehand. This is for the builder. Uh, for the contractor and uh, documents are really 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 important so a lot of this is we have all these materials sitting out there let's say it's early in the construction project it's not enclosed yet so we have all of this material and different types of equipment that's literally sitting out in the open okay that's the most exposed it's going to be and like i said earlier the claims that we see a lot of times are flying objects. 
So that generator, which is very expensive, gets even more expensive as it flies into the side of a building. So that's for the builder's risk. Needless to say, on the GL, if it picks it up and slams it into the, the hotel down the street, that could be a GL plane, right? So another way of looking at it is that way too. So you want to keep the project as cleaned up as much as possible. And this is probably ongoing. So I think contractors that build in coastal areas, uh, they need to be aware of this and keep their projects cleaner than they would even in other areas. Uh, it's all about tying things down. If you can't move it, you don't have time to move it somewhere else. Make sure it's tied down. After the storm, a lot of times we can, it's not even recognizable. We don't know. So hopefully you took some pictures of the project before the storm. Maybe that'd be a good thing to do. Uh, next, we got to file the insurance claim. The quicker you file, you get in line. Hopefully the adjusters are there to help you out pretty quick. But I would say the quicker you file the claim, the quicker it's going to get settled. Once again, the more accurate you are of what happened, uh, the better, you know, probably the bigger the claim payment you're going to get. And it's all about being reasonable. So if you can show that you have these plans in place before the storm, I think that's going to help you with your claim. So there you kind of have it. We kind of touched on the coverage a little bit. If you don't mind the main coverage form, the deductibles. Uh, we touched on the loss control aspects of job sites. They're a little different than others. And like I said, this applies mostly we're talking about tropical weather systems, but you could say it's any catastrophic event. It's all about pre-planning. So what I'd like to do now is open this up for questions. Uh, hopefully, Alex, are you still there? We uh, open it up. Hi, Jeff. A couple questions came in. Um, one first question. If things are being delivered for the interior, such as appliances, cabinets, et cetera, are those things covered? Uh, hopefully. So the reason I say that is that, you know, these are proprietary forms. I can say on our form it wouldn't be as long as it was part of the completed value of the structure. Once they're delivered at the job site, they're covered, whether they're owned by the contractor, the developer, or the subcontractor. Uh, but you would need to verify that. That's a good question. So make sure you talk to your underwriter to make sure they should be covered. Okay. Um, if a hurricane is headed to a specific state, how soon before the hurricane lands is coverage normally halted? All right. I like to say normally because I don't answer for the entire you know, insurance industry and every carrier is really they're different. My experience has been it's distance more than time. So usually they study it. And if it's within 600 nautical miles, that's a number I've heard many times, that's when they'll shut the coverage down. No binding after that. So it could be moving at 20 miles an hour or 10 miles an hour. So the time is kind of irrelevant. It's really the distance. So, you know, you, usually, you know, a day or two before the storm hits, it's shut down. Three days, two, three days is a good general rule of thumb. And the problem is it's too late to do anything then. They shut it down. All right. Um, let's see, I'm going to add on to that question for a second of my curiosity. How soon after a hurricane is over do they normally open it back up? Very good question. And that's, I, I've seen that all over the place. You know, I mean, I've seen some companies that open it up back very quickly. I will say our goal is trying to open it back up as quick as we can, because what do we want to do? One thing that this sounds kind of cold and calculating, but from a builder's risk standpoint, once the storm leaves, we have a lot of opportunity to write coverage on the storm damaged properties. So the quicker we open it up, the quicker we can start insuring those projects. I'll use Hurricane uh, Harvey in the Gulf Coast a couple of years ago in Houston. We opened back up maybe the day after it was finally gone because it lingered out there for a long time. And we, we covered a lot of property in Houston uh, as we fixed it up. Former employer of mine, we, uh, we opened up New Orleans pretty quick after Katrina came through and ended up writing a, a lot of business. Uh, help, and so you're doing a job of helping prepare the community, I mean, repair the community. So that's something that's up to each individual carrier. But personally, I think, uh, you know, you try to open it up from a company standpoint as soon as you can. Fantastic. Um, let's see. What is Schinner's capacity per project for wind-prone areas? 
All right, I'll be a little bit of a politician here. It does vary depending on where you're at. Uh, depends on the construction type. So there's a lot of variables to say this is what it is. Uh, you know, it's safe to assume that we, we could readily go to 5 million frame and we could readily go to 25 million all other construction types, towards the masonry, non-combustible MNC. Uh, and this could be a little bit up or down depending on where you're at, whether it's, you know, there is a difference between Broward and Dade County and, uh, uh, you know, Harris County, Texas. They have different guidelines. And I don't think we're unique there. Every carrier does. So, uh, but the easiest thing is just check with us. We're open for business. Whatever you got, give us a call and hopefully we can help you out. All right. Is there a loss prevention guide available for project managers at exposed job sites? Uh, I think we're going to create one. So there's not one that I could send you right now, but after this and thinking about it, I think we need to have one. So I will work with our loss control engineers and come up with something because I think that would be nice, something you could maybe hand to your contractors. So I'll work on that. So thank you, Kevin, for the suggestion. Fantastic. Um, okay, those are the only questions that have come in. Okay, well, once again, I really appreciate you guys taking the time today. Uh, we're here to help you. I guess it's my last screen here. There's my contact information and Donna's contact information. So pick up the phone, send us an email, text us, however you want to communicate, it's fine by us. Uh, and like I said, April 25th, we're heading towards June 1st. So now's the time to ask your questions. And I will say April 25th is a good day because it's my birthday today. So I'd tell everybody that. So it's a special day. So we'll say now. Why did I remember that? It's Jeff's birthday, and it's time to start preparing for hurricanes. How's that? So, with that note, I think I'll leave you all for the day. And once again, stay tuned. We'll be doing another one of these in a month, and we'll pick a subject that I think is important to all of you, and we'll work on that. And if you have any ideas for things you want to know more about to run these webinars, by all means, let me know, because uh, we are flexible. So, once again, have a great time today. Have a good day, and I will talk to you soon. See you later.